On Tuesday, voters in Oregon and Pennsylvania delivered a stunning rebuke to the mansion wing of the Democratic Party, as well as uh, gigantic super PACs. So let me uh, break that down. In Pennsylvania, you had John Fetterman uh, that crushed Connor Lamb. I was going to say sheared, but you know, uh, by a huge margin, even after Fetterman uh, suffered a stroke on Friday and spent election day getting a pacemaker implanted. He's feeling pretty good now, uh, recovering. Uh, and so that's good news. And, uh, you know, when it was done, he realized that he had won the election. Uh, of course, he was expecting to win gigantic margin in the polls. Uh, and so that's great. Uh, Fetterman, I would say pretty good, much, much better than Connor Lamb. And so, yeah, that's awesome. Now, you also had Summer Lee, a rising progressive, uh, squeaking out a close victory against anti-labor attorney Steve Irwin. So that's good. Uh, in Oregon, you also had Kurt Schrader losing to Jamie McLeod Skinner, despite being outspent 10 to 1. Uh, Charles Booker winning his primary in Kentucky. He's going to take on Rand Paul. We'll see how that goes. Um, these victories, fantastic. Very important. Uh, because at the end of the day, you had big money and big endorsements that did not win, as well as, of course, proof that this centrism, this this moderate Democrat mantra that you hear, oh, we have to have moderate Democrats that can win in these places like Pennsylvania. No, it turns out progressives can win there, too. So now... Ryan Grimm, The Intercept, kind of breaks down how much money was spent in these races. Uh, let's go to Summer Lee. Now, her opponent, Irwin, was backed by a Republican super PAC. So, look, you shouldn't be surprised that Republican super PACs will now spend money in Democratic primaries. In fact, Bernie Sanders has called this out and says, hey, maybe we, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have big Republican money interfering in Democratic primaries. But of course, nobody's going to listen to that. Nobody cares uh, in the establishment because guess what? It's all the same donor money. And it, it basically goes to all the politicians regardless of party. So that said, you had this Republican super PAC uh, backing uh, Mr. Irwin. And that was linked to APAC. Now, uh, one of the PACs from APAC... <laughs> Uh, is called the United Democracy Project. A and they poured more than a million dollars into ads in Pennsylvania's 12th district. The bulk of that messaging, of course, were attack ads against Lee, uh, though just over $100,000 went to materials supporting Irwin. In total, UDP spent more than $2.3 million in that race. That's a lot of money. That is a lot, a lot of money. Hmm. Uh, now, Democratic Majority for Israel, you might be familiar with that pact, spent heavily against Nina Turner uh, and both of her races uh, in Ohio. Um, well, they also spent heavily against Lee. However, unlike in the case of Nina Turner, Lee had some backup. In fact, you had the Working Families Party, Justice Democrats, J Street, uh, which is uh, uh, in... Uh, Pro a progressive Israel PAC uh, that had spent on Lee's behalf to the tune of around $1.7 million. So she had the cavalry this time. Uh, and again, as I point out, that cavalry did not exist on behalf of Nina Turner. So, I mean, that's incredibly unfortunate. They also use the same messaging against uh, Lee that they used against Turner. For example, they called her not a Democrat, somebody who would go out and, uh, and attack Biden's agenda, which, again, is absolutely ridiculous. In both cases, do you think that if a minimum wage increase, $15 uh, minimum wage, right, uh, or even an expansion of ACA subsidies, do you think if that came across the desk of Summer Lee or Nina Turner that they would say no? No, that's ridiculous. Of course they would. No, they would sign it. Uh, and then they would, of course, say, OK, this is a good start, but how about we actually do more? 
Yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, so I, I love the whole, you're not a real Democrat messaging. And by the way, Summer Lee, and, and, and this is why there was so much DMFI money in this race, Summer Lee criticized Israel. And so, and uh, is a pro-Palestinian. Again, that's another thing that Nina Turner had in common. She also supported the rights of Palestinian people to not get massacred and to not have illegal settlements and their houses stolen. So now, again, I'm making these parallels because it is very interesting that they did not support Turner, but supported Lee. Again, I think both of them in Congress would be fantastic, but it do at least we do have one. So now, again, Lee also ran on policies like the new uh, Green New Deal, Medicare for All, and is very pro labor. Uh, now she prevailed. In fact, I want to give you her uh, victory speech here. This was uh, from last night after the results were given. So uh, look, she did say very correctly too. Every vote mattered. It it came down to at one point a forty vote difference. So everyone who showed up, it did matter, it, and it mattered greatly. And now Pennsylvania, uh, uh, that district gets their first African American female representative. So that does matter, and, and so. Uh, representation matters, as does policy. Uh, and she's right on both of those. All right, so now, uh, that's Lee. Let's go on to Fetterman. So now, Fetterman ran against Connor Lamb. Uh, uh, Lamb actually ended up having the endorsement of every single establishment Democrat, uh, high official and county organization in the state. Also, Joe Manchin. You would think that that kind of would, kind of would be the um, kiss of death, considering how unpopular Joe Manchin is across the country. Now, uh, nonetheless, we had uh, Lamb losing by a gigantic am uh, amount, nearly 30 points. So... Look, he got crushed. Uh, Fetterman ran in a more populist policy. Uh, Lamb, uh, of course. It's funny. I, I had a tweet um, that was responding to Connor Lamb from last year that blew up yesterday <laughs> um, where he was talking about, uh, if you're looking for a socialist, uh, you're, I'm the wrong guy. And I said, well, look, they're going to call you a socialist no matter what. So you might actually want to do something to help the people instead of not, instead of helping your donors. Well, uh, look, Conor Lamb was owned by the donors. 
he was only going to serve those donors. Uh, Fetterman, I think he's going to do a lot better. So now here's the thing. What is what what was very interesting, getting back to the, the super PACs here and the big money, DMFI and APAC actually did not spend against Fetterman in this race. Now, I thought that was very interesting. Um, now, there's a reason. Uh, David Dole uh, correctly points out in this tweet, worth mentioning Fetterman came out is extremely pro-Israel a month before the vote, meaning the same money that was spent against other progressives was not spent against him. So I think that is important to point out. Uh, foreign policy is incredibly important. Um, Fetterman being not great on the issue of Palestine, again, is not great. And it is important to note. At the same time, though, on other issues, especially domestic issues, there's no doubt he'll be better than Connor Lamb. Uh, and so... I'll take it. I'll take the wins where I can, understanding that where he might be weak and might, and and what you know, what might we might be able to push him on that too, uh, and so that's what's important. We can try to push him on that issue, uh, and hopefully he can bend on that issue. If not, then at least we have him on other issues uh, where he is a solidly decent progressive. So. Again, mixed bag, right? Uh, but generally better than Lamb. I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, and look, again, he could be he could be good on this issue. We just need to see all of these people in action. And I think that's important because their actions do matter. And so what we have to do is we have to judge him by their actions. Yeah, Harper Gall points out, no one's perfect, but Fetterman, more perfect than Lamb. I would agree with that. And again, we're going to take the wins where we can, guys. Uh, they don't have to be perfect on the issues. And when where they're not, we can absolutely try to push them the best that we can. All right. Now, that said, there's more. Um, a super PAC funded by pharmaceutical industry, uh, by the pharmaceutical industry, blew more than a million dollars to protect another corporate Democrat. This is Blue Dog Coalition care, uh, Chair Kurt Schrader. Uh, the Oregon Democrat who cast a deciding vote against drug pricing reform in the House and Energy Commerce uh, Committee and organized with Representative Josh Gottheimer to derail Biden's Build Back Better. So Jamie McLeod Skinner went after him uh, on that, went after his corporate ties, referred to him as the Joe Manchin of the House. She then pointed out his corruption. And I think that was a very, very smart uh, a, a campaign decision. Uh, Schrader had brought in about $2 million in outside super PAC support, half of it from the pharmaceutical industry compared with McLeod Skinner's roughly $340,000 from two different PACs, Working Families Party and Indivisible. Adding to adding in his own spending, Schrader actually outspent Jamie McLeod Skinner by about 10 to 1. God damn. So look, he had that money. That was obvious. Uh, however, McLeod Skinner actually used his greatest strength, that money against him, by calling out the corruption, calling out corporate ties, linking his relationship with the pharmaceutical industry to his constant undermining of Biden's agenda. And I think that's really important because, look, uh, most of you watching the show are, are likely very progressive and want to go further left than Biden's agenda. And we're kind of upset, a lot of us, understandably so, um, for the good reason that we can't even get the basic, the bare minimum that is Biden's agenda, much less things that we actually should already have, things like universal health care and free college. And so, look, um, Biden's agenda, though, when you ask mainstream, you know, CNN, MSNBC Democrats, well, they all support they all support Biden's agenda. And also a lot of them tend to support the more progressive agenda even, you know, when they don't support progressive politicians. And I think that's very interesting. When you talk to people on policy, they generally support things like single payer. So now, uh, what's interesting here uh, uh, about that is, again, if you run on, hey, this guy is super corrupt and he is bringing down Biden's agenda and you can prove that, well, people are very, very unhappy with Biden. 
right now his poll numbers are incredibly low. Why? It's because he hasn't done anything. And a lot of it, again, it has to do with being blocked in Congress. You know, the Republicans, of course, are not going to block anything good. That's by default. But then you've got a cast of corporate Democrats that are also blocking Biden's agenda. People like Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema, Josh Gottheimer, Kurt Schrader, the so-called moderates, the so-called blue dogs. And of course, Biden himself, not, not really pushing for his own agenda as hard as you would think someone who is interested in his own agenda would be pushing. And so there's that. But again, when it comes to uh, rhetorically beating uh, corporate Democrats, calling out that corruption and saying he, he is not actually being a good Democrat, I think that's effective messaging when it comes to grabbing those voters who were actually a little bit more aligned on policy, even if we're not aligned on tactics generally, right? And again, there's a lot of gaslighting. There's a lot of disinformation about progressive candidates and where they stand that gets spewed on corporate media, on cable news. So now that said, Democrats want Biden to go and, and, and do things like prescription drug reform, uh, allowing Medicare to negotiate uh, prescription drugs that was very popular among all Americans, not just Democrats. You had the child tax credit, also incredibly popular. Child care, paid leave. These are these are just basic things that we should have already had in this country that people do want. So it's corporate Democrats again, like Mansion, Cinema, Gottheimer, Schrader, who con who ultimately tanked it. And so, look, if those two, by the way, weren't there, um, Manchin and Sinema in the Senate, well, somebody else would have stepped up and undermined Biden's agenda on behalf of the corporate donors. That's why we need more progressives in office. Now, there's more. A super PAC funded by a cryptocurrency fortune called Protect Our Future also spent $10 million to boost uh, another corporate Democrat named Carrick Flynn. Flynn ended up losing to another progressive uh, State Representative Andrew Salinas, um, who was endorsed by progressive groups as well as Elizabeth Warren. She'll be elected the first Latina to Congress from the state of Oregon. If she wins the general, she is expected to win that. Uh, now, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's uh, House Majority PAC blew a million dollars supporting the cryptocurrency funded candidate. So, again, that's really good to see. Oh, oh, crypt, crypto bro and Nancy Pelosi getting together to both lose fun. Oh, I love it. I love it so much. So now this whole thing ended up being a route for these big money corporation or uh, uh, these big money packs, corporate packs, uh, and so-called moderate Democrats, which are really, again, just corporate Democrats, um, and, and these, these blue dogs, right? It really shows the failure of centrism or centrist candidates in our electoral system. Nobody wants them anymore because guess what? They, they want people to actually do things, do good policy. Uh, now, Ryan Grimm, he wrote this in The Intercept about it, quote, the stunning wins comes as the party debates who's to blame for Biden's sinking approval rating and increasingly dire forecasts of upcoming midterm losses. Party establishment figures have pointed the finger at the left. Ha ha. Of course they would. And I've told you about that numerous times, how they were going to blame the left, who is currently not in power and a minority of the party who has been going along and trying to get Biden's agenda passed. They were going to blame them for the losses anyway, uh, or potential losses. Uh, they point the finger at the left, uh, Grimm writes, for making unreasonable demands couched in slogans like defund the police that turn off voters. So this is uh, this is James Carville right there um, and others talking about that. I, I think maybe Hakeem Jeffries has talked about the same thing. Um However, the progressive wing has counted that Biden's popularity is sunk as centrist Democrats have murdered his agenda while the left has fought to enact it. That's actually true. Centrists have 
tried to murder Biden's agenda, and very successfully so. No reconciliation bill. You need 51 votes for a reconciliation bill to pass a Republican filibuster. Couldn't get uh, Manchin and Cinema on board. And they wouldn't do anything to get Manchin and Cinema on board. Manchin, by the way, oh, okay, so so let's start with Cinema. Cinema is incredibly corrupt. She's taken so much money from the pharmaceutical industry. Why don't you call that out? Why don't you talk about that? Oh, right, because a lot of Democrats take money from the pharmaceutical industry uh, in donations and do everything the pharmaceutical industry says. Then you have Joe Manchin, who, you know, owns a, he's a literal coal baron. His son owns a coal company that he had founded in like the, I think it was the 80s or the 90s. And then he, uh, his daughter also ran a company, uh, Mylan Pharmaceuticals, who jacked up the price of the EpiPen after colluding with Pfizer to, to make sure that they don't come up with a, comp uh, a competing generic version that would lower the price, and they shared the profits. Literal collusion and trying to corner the market to make a monopoly so that these companies could make tons of money gouging the average person for the EpiPen. Just absolutely disgusting. Now, did any of the Democrats trying to pressure Manchin, did they bring that up? Joe Biden say, hey, we heard some things, very disturbing things about some, uh, about some collusion, you know? Price fixing, why don't we look into that? Or, you know, we might not look into that. We might turn, turn our head if you decide to you know, go with our uh, agenda, allow our agenda to pass. Hmm. But they didn't do that. But they didn't do that. Uh, so now Tuesday's results, going back to Grimm, suggested Democratic voters, at least those in Pennsylvania and Oregon, would prefer the Democrats do more than rather than less, delivering a stinging rebuke to Kirsten Cinema, Manchin, wing of the party. Next week, voters in Texas will cast ballots in a number of runoffs that pit progressives against super-backed centrist Democrats. That's, of course, Jessica, uh, Jessica Cisneros is one of the big ones versus Henry Cuellar. Uh, Henry Cuellar, again, one of the most corrupt corporate Democrats, takes massive amounts of money from oil and gas, uh, had some shady connections with Azerbaijani oil interests, and is under investigation by the FBI. Um, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, that race is going to happen. And uh, we're hoping Jessica Cisneros can pull out that win. Now, look, um, this is great. These wins against this money. And, and I understand that it's, you know, we still lost some races last night, too. But as progressives, that's to be expected. Because understand that we are outgunned massively, both by money, media, and, of course, endorsements. All of them do matter to some extent with the voters, especially when it comes to messaging, getting out the messaging. Uh, so, look, every win, every win's important. We're the underdogs. We got to understand that. And as stinging as the defeat of Nina Turner was, that was one battle out of many, many others that need to be waged. And yes, it is a long slog to try to get people on the inside. By the way, the inside strategy isn't the only strategy. It's only part of the strategy. It is important to have people on the inside because they're the ones that are actually going to be casting the votes for things. So you got to have that. But you also got to have that massive pressure on the outside. And that means organizing your community, organizing your workplace, getting together to put pressure on the outside of the system itself in order to affect change and to get the people that are on the inside to actually vote, to, to feel enough pressure, to make enough noise, enough good trouble to actually, you know, make the people on the inside cast the votes in the ways that you want.